Welcome everybody to tutorial number five on this tutorial series on R. Today we're going to be analyzing data for the first time starting with linear regression analyses of our child aggression study. To begin, um, I just want to remind everybody of three things. First of all, please download, if you haven't already, the R code and data sets on our GitHub. Second, make sure that you've changed your directory to the location where you've or where you've um, put that R code and data sets. And then finally, because we've already covered in quite extensive detail the basics of coding in R as well as getting descriptive statistics and, um, and plotting, I'm going to go over that particular code in all the tutorials going forward quite quickly because um, we've covered that already in detail and I really want to focus each tutorial on the new topics that we review. To begin, make sure you install the packages, load those packages once you've installed them. So let's load ours. And then we are going to disable or disable scientific notation and set our directory in preparation for importing and creating our data frame of the child aggression study data. We're also going to add the observation IDs because we need those for our plots. And let's start with part one. So I'm just going to scroll down. Um, I have here commented off a basic description or introduction to coding linear models in R. So linear models have the following form. They consist of this LM function with the brackets, and the first part of the function consists of a formula, followed by a comma, and then the data. And the variables in your formula refer to columns in your data frame. More specifically, the formula has this general form of Y with this squiggly mark in your model. And what that basically, what that squiggly operator specifies is that the variable is being predicted by certain predictors in your model. And in the formula itself, each predictor um, is separated by either nothing. So this is the first one we're talking about, either nothing, if you, you only have one predictor in your model. So for instance, in a simple linear regression and the general form of a simple linear regression, where you just have one predictor is this. So you have Y, which is your outcome variable or your dependent variable, whatever term you want to use, um, being predicted by this predictor called A, which refers to a column within your data frame, which we're just calling my, da my data um, here. If you have more than one predictor, however, then um, the actual operators do matter. So we have a plus sign, which just refers to additive effects or what you might call lower order main effects. And uh, the general form of these types of linear models where you have more than one predictor are, um, let's say you have two predictors, A and B, you have Y is a function of A plus B. You can also define interaction terms or what are called higher order effects using the colon, which connects um, the two or more factors that you want to um, test if there's a significant interaction between them. And they have the general form of this. You, again, use the LM function and Y squiggly mark, and then you have the two lower order effects and then their higher order interaction. So A in the colon with B. Now there, R also has this asterisk function, which we're going to, or asterisk operator, which we're going to use. And that's just a shorthand to tell R to automatically define the lower and higher order effects of your predictors. So for instance, um, here we have this linear model of Y predicted by A and B, and we have the asterisk, which basically is equivalent to what we just showed, what I just showed you above, where we have Y and the, um, the two lower order effects and their interaction. That's really the meat and bones of formula for linear models in R. If you want more information, you can either just run this help function in the console, or um, there is a nice little website, which I think in a general high level, gives a general high level, high level review of formula in R, which I, I encourage you to look at. So let's actually define our first linear model or linear regression in R. So again, we're using this M um, variable, which is just a habit I've come to form over the last number of years of just defining any statistical model or test with the letter M because each test generates a list 
um, which has a variety of information which isn't necessarily um, displayed in the output. So to define the linear model, what we're going to be doing is predicting child aggression scores. That's our outcome variable or our dependent variable. And for this linear model, we're having one predictor, which is a coercive parenting style. So we're going to run that line of code, and then I'll show you what happens. So you don't see any statistics, but it does show you the parameter estimates for the intercept and the um, predictor. If you um, are automatically... Um, automatically adds an intercept to a regre regression formula. So I, have, I haven't explicitly defined the intercept in this particular line of code, but you can do that. And the way you explicitly define an intercept is with a one. It makes no difference, so I don't actually typically do so uh, because of the fact that it's automatically added anyway. So you can see if I run this line of code where I explicitly define the intercept, it produces the exact same model. Now, if you want to actually see the statistics of the fitting procedures of your particular model, you use the summary function, which is a generic function. And there's a special package which you've installed, which allows you to extract the standardized coefficients because the summary function only generates the unstandardized coefficients. So let's run, um, let's just first run the summary function. So this is the, um, this is our, our model, our, our simple linear regression. This is just code explaining, just describing what model we, are, we have run. Um, these are descriptive statistics of the residuals. And then this is the meat and bones, or, or the main part, you might say, of the simple linear regression. So we have the coefficients, which of course are the intercept in our single predictor, the coercive parenting style. Each have their associated unstandardized coefficients. So you can see a coercive parenting style has a positive association with, a, a, with child aggression. So the higher levels of coercive parenting style are associated with higher levels of aggression. And there's the associated standard error of each of those coefficients and the t-statistic, which of course is just the s, which is just the, the coefficient divided by its standard error. And then you have the two-tailed p-value of that t-statistic. And it's two-tailed because it's the absolute value of t. And as you can see, um, the our predictor is a significant predictor of child aggression. And then R very helpfully provides you that's not a word helpfully, <laughs> very kindly provides you with the alpha thresholds at which a particular effect is statistically significant. The final part of the output consists of the model fit indices. So there's three of them. You have what's called the quote unquote st uh, residual standard error, which in this case is 0 0.312. Um, it is not the standard error of the residuals. It is actually the standard deviation. I don't know why R says that, um, and because it's definitely not true, it's misleading nomenclature. So I can prove it to you that it's not the standard um, error, but rather the standard deviation. And what do you know? There's the standard deviation of the residuals. The standard error, of course, would be the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, which you can see is not that value. Uh, similarly, if we took the degrees of freedom, it's not that value. So that is definitely not the standard error of the residuals. It's the standard deviation. The second part, the second fit statistics statistic we have are the R squared. So the multiple R squared is just the unadjusted R squared. So we see that about 4% of the overall variation in aggression scores is explained by this, by this uh, model. And then the adjusted R squared is, of course, the um, uses the degrees of freedom to calculate the R squared and uh, um, yeah, so and it produces a very similar estimate. And finally, we have the F test, which, as some of you may know, is comparing the full model with the intercept only model, which is the overall mean of aggression scores. And it is a statistically significant um, uh, F statistic, meaning that this model produces a better is a better model of the outcome measure than just taking the um, average of the aggression scores. And then finally, let's actually look at the standardized coefficients, which again, some of you may already know, um, in a simple linear regression are just the Pearson correlation coefficients between the predictor and the outcome. So we have a Pearson correlation of 0.21 between um, 
a coercive parenting style, and aggression scores. Moving on to part two, um, we're going to actually ex explore a list. So we're using this aggression, um, the linear regression output as an example. And the way you explore lists are through um, mainly the dollar sign, and then you can pull out different objects. So I've just, I'm typing in the console here and using the arrow keys to cycle through the different options. So you see that the linear model actually produces a bunch of information that isn't captured in the output, which is why I, I like to define my an arbitrary variable called m so that I can access that information. So I can get, um, so we'll just run the code over that we've already typed out. So m, uh, so the rank is basically the number of coefficients in the model. We can actually ex extract those, the coefficients themselves. So we get the intercept and the parenting style if we wanted to. Um, and even within the that particular object of coefficient, we can take out the um, the first object within that um, within that overall object. So we're, we can by using the square brackets and putting one, it picks out the first object, which is the intercept coefficient, and then uh, the second object is the in, is the coefficient of the predictor. We can also uh, get the predicted values or what are called fitted values. Um, and we can also get the, uh, yeah, so we can get the fitted value. So I'm using the head because it's going to generate otherwise 666 values. So you can see here, that's the predicted values for participant one, two, three, four, five, and six. You can similarly just, um, another way to get the predicted values is to apply the predict function, which is a, I believe a built-in function in R. And it obviously generates the same values. Similarly, you can get the, using by exploring the list, you can get the residuals. So we'll show them. So the residuals, of course, are the observed values of the child aggression scores minus the predicted values. And then there's a built in function called residuals, which does the same thing as as cycling through the actual um, uh, list generated by the linear model, which we do, which we did in this previous uh, line of code. And then if you are so inclined, you can manually calculate the residuals using the same formula I just described of the difference between the observed aggression scores and the predicted values. And finally, and this is important because we're going to plot these, uh, you can put the residuals and predicted values in your data frame by attaching it to the end of it, which is what we're going to do now. And then we're going to look at our data frame. So let's open this up. And there you go. So we have our predicted values for each particular participant, as well as their residuals, which again are the difference between the, their aggression score and the predicted value. So let's move on to part three, which is actually plotting our regression model. And we're going to do two plots. There's two methods. Um, so a lot of this will be familiar from the previous tutorial. We're doing a scatter plot, and then we're fitting a regression line to that scatter plot. So we've seen this line of code in the previous tutorial, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. The first bit defines the, the data frame and the X and Y coordinates that are then going to apply to all the other layers. We then set the Y and X axis limits. We then define the scales of the Y and X axis. This is a new line of code. This is how you define the main title of the of a plot. And then for whatever reason, R by default, or ggplot, I mean by default, puts the title at the top left corner. So this is how you center it. And then we have our, we define our X and Y axis labels. And then we're going to do use the geom point function to create uh, the scatter plot. And they're going to be um, hollow circles, which is what the shape equals one does. So let's just run that to see what happens. So we generate our scatter plot here. Let's expand it. So there's our scatter plot of child aggression scores as a function of a coercive parenting style. And what we want to do is fit a line through it, which is the line that our linear model just estimated. One method you can use is actually using the geom ab line function, where you just manually plug in the intercept and slope, and it'll automatically produce a line. And that's what we do. So we actually pick out the intercept using the same um, the same uh, method that I was showing you above when I was showing you how to explore a list. So we pick out the first object within this coefficient object, which is the intercept coefficient. And then similarly, we pick out the second object, 
which is the coefficient of the predictor, which is just the slope describing the relationship between the predictor and the outcome measure. We can set the color of the line, which is going to be green, and then size just is the size of the line. So let's run that whole line of code. And nothing's happened because we've defined this variable called plot1. So let's actually run plot1 to see what's in there. And there you go. We have our the same scatter plot, but we've overlaid another layer of the um, regression line. So you can see the intercept with the, uh, and then it's, it's, yeah, it's our regression line. And a, a similar method. So one limitation of this first method is that it doesn't actually plot the confidence intervals around the actual predictor or around the actual um, regression line, I mean. So if that's something you want to do, this is how you can do it. So this code is exactly the same as the previous code that I've just showed you up here. The only difference is instead of geom ab line, we're using a function called geom smooth, which basically fits a line um, to the data. And you define the method. We're using a linear model because we're fitting a linear model. SE, which uh, technically generally means standard error, but in this case means confidence interval is true. And we want it to be the 95% confidence interval. So we're defining level as 0.95. And again, it's going to be a green line size one. So let's run that line of code or this whole code, I mean, and see what happens. So let's plot let's run plot two see what's in there you can just ignore that it's nothing it's not a problem and so we have a similar line uh the well the exact same line um except the we have this green shade around it which describes the 95 percent confidence interval and you can see that most of the data is not included in the confidence interval which is consistent with the fact that the r squared of this model is only four percent of the overall variation or variance, I mean, in child aggression scores. One thing, and someone may correct me, but for whatever reason, you can't actually get the geom smooth to extend the line out to the intercept um, unless you actually have a zero value. Uh, so it's sort of stuck there. I can't, you can't actually extend it out, which is one reason why I prefer, personally, I prefer the, the geom ab line. Now, let's say you wanted to combine all the plots into one, um, one plot. Uh, for example, for a publication, there's a particular package which you've just installed, and within that package, there's a gg arrange function, which will, and you can put as many different plots as you want. They just need to be they need to be variables that you've defined as being a plot, and then you arrange them however you want in, in terms of columns and rows. So these are going to be there's two columns and one row, so they're going to be side by side. So let's run that line of code, and there you go. We have our two plots using the ab line and the um, the geom smoother uh, function to plot our linear model. Now let's say you wanted to save this plot um, to your computer. So first of all, you can actually just manually save it. Go to export, save image as. You want to set your directory. So I'm just going to go to our tutorial because that's where, where I'm working out of. And then you can define it whatever you want. So we'll just call this combined plot and then we'll save it and you can adjust the height and width save it and then let's actually look at it so there it is there's the combined plot now let's say for whatever reason you just want to automatically save things without having to go through this you know, manually clicking so there I've, I've explained four different ways you can do this for four different types of files we have png files jpeg files bmp files and pdf files so the key thing is, is that your plot has to be after the function which defines the type of file you want to save it as. So for instance here, this is the PNG function, say, and then you have the plot afterwards. And then finally, this dev.off actually saves it to your computer. So here we are, uh, we're using that familiar paste function to basically define the name of this particular file. It's going to be a .png file, and we're pasting the directory, so that's going to it's going to give the address so that this function knows where to save this particular plot, plot I mean, and we're, we're defining the height and width of that plot. So let's just run this line of code and then the dev.off actually saves it. And run that. And then we should see in our, um, there it is. Yeah. So in our directory, we actually have the plot. So it actually saved as a PNG file. And there it is.
So now let's just, since it's exactly the same line of code for the other three, um, let's run them. The only difference, of course, is that it, rather than PNG um, function, it uses the JPEG, BMP, or PDF function. We'll run all of them. And we should see in our directory all of them there. And then let's open up the PDF version. And there you can see this nice PDF of our plots. Moving on to part five, let's actually assess parametric test assumptions. So uh, this is just sort of, you're, you're going to get an insight into how I do things. Maybe you might do things a little bit different. So I tend to like to look at the histogram of the outcome variable just to get a general sense of outliers. So we've already seen this function before in the previous tutorial. So, you know, or maybe these are outliers out here. You might consider trimming um, or you may not. You would definitely want to know who exactly those, those kids are and why are there scores on the extremes. Um, also, similarly to identify outliers, we can use that box and whisker plot we've reviewed in the previous tutorial on descriptive statistics and plots. So we can see again using the um, 1.5 times the interquartile range of the whiskers. These are the whiskers, which are 1.5 times the interquartile range. Anything outside of them may be an, an outlier, which you would want to further explore and potentially um, remove them. Um, or not, depending on if it makes sense to remove that particular person. Now, really helpful, especially when assessing for normality, since as many of you may know, although many people surprisingly are confused about this, it is not normality of the outcome or predictor variables that matters. It's actually normality of the residuals of the model, which matters for parametric test assumptions. So, um, you know, before we actually extracted the residuals of our simple linear regression and put it into our data frame. And the reason why is for this particular reason, I want to plot them. So let's do a histogram. It's the exact same function as the one above. And let's look at those residuals. Let's expand this. So um, already it's looking kind of good. You know, that's a normal looking distribution of the residuals. It's symmetrical. It's bell shaped. Um, so that's really reassuring. It's not obviously skewed. Um, now, another helpful thing, this is a not a built-in function. It's from the package called ggfortify. It's called autoplot. So with linear models, you can apply this function, which automatically generates a bunch of diagnostic plots to look at the assumptions of normality, um, uh, homogeneity of variance, or what's also called homoscedasticity. And you can also look at um, outliers with these plots. And uh, you can also look at the assumption of whether linearity is, is met. So let's run this function. I'm going to expand it because it, it's quite a big plot. It's four plots. So I will go over these plots just briefly. Um, there's a lot of information online which des describes them if you're not familiar with them. And I do go into these plots in our lecture series. So just first of all, I forgot to explain this. Auto plot, you, you put the actual model that you want to plot and then there's about i think six plots this function will produce i just picked the first four because they're in my opinion the most informative so here we have at the top left corner we have the residuals by predicted values gives us a sense of linearity and homogeneity of variance or homoscedasticity as well as potential outliers which this function very very um in a very helpful way, actually tells you the participant IDs, or in this case, row numbers of these participants who may be outliers. Um, and the, if you don't know how to interpret these, that's you got to look at our, our lectures. But, but basically, this looks like there's a generally a linear, the linearity assumption is true. And also, there is um, homoscedasticity, which is good. That's an, an assumption of parametric tests. The normal QQ plot. Um, if it was perfectly normal, this, these are the standardized residuals. So in case you don't know, anything that says standardized in statistics means that you divided the, 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 the standardized thing by the, the standard deviation of that thing. So in this case, the standardized residuals are the raw residuals divided by the standard deviation of the residuals. So and it's plotting it against the theoretical quantiles of a normal distribution. And if it was perfectly normal, the residuals were perfectly normal, they would be all aligned along this line here. But they're not. Um, this basically shows um, what's called positive kurtosis. There's, you know, for kurtosis or skew, they have particular patterns in the QQ plots. We go into this in our statistics lectures. Similarly, or not similarly, uh, 
but a similar plot to the residual plot is this scale location plot. It's basically the residuals by the predicted values, but it, it basically takes the standardized residuals, the absolute value, so you see those little bars on either end, that means the absolute value, and does the standard deviation of those absolute values of the standardized residuals. That was a mouthful. But it basically gives you the same or a similar picture to what the raw residuals by predicted values are. And overall, although there is a little bit of a bow in the fitted line, uh, it does show that linearity is approximately true. And so, and there's also generally speaking, um, homogeneity of variance or homoscedasticity. And then finally, we have Cook's distance, which is an index of the influence of particular observations on the regression model so that it identifies automatically three observations which may have a significant or an influential effect on the regression model and if those are also outliers you may consider um, removing them or may not um, depending on if that makes sense based off of the data. Finally, or not finally, uh, the two last things with regards to parametric assumptions are you can actually calculate the um, metrics of skew and kurtosis using the describe function. And there are, um, there are three main statistical tests to test the normality of the residuals. So first of all, uh, we are going to des uh, describe the residuals. And there's three different types to calculate these particular um, skew and kurtosis um, statistics. Uh, I just chose type one. There's honestly very modest differences between them. So, but you can play around with type one, two, or three. So here we go. Um, this is the, these are the residuals. It just automatically gave it this arbitrary variable, but these are the descriptive statistics of the residuals. So they have a mean of zero, which is, that's reassuring. Um, standard deviation of uh, 0.31, which we already know from our the fitted model. And then the crucial thing are these last two pieces here, the skew and kurtosis. Um, the way this describe function works, as some of you may be aware, there's two ways to calculate kurtosis. It, uh, the, a normal distribution will have a kurtosis of either three or zero, depending on the, what the reference is. This function uses the zero as the reference. So a normal distribution is zero. Anything above zero is called positive kurtosis. Anything below zero is negative kurtosis. Similarly, anything above zero is positive skew. Anything below zero is negative skew. So you can see there's this the data is not very skewed, which is consistent with the histogram of the residuals we saw. And similarly, there is a little bit of positive kurtosis, which is consistent with the QQ plot. But um, in my opinion, as well as the opinion of others, you know, kurtosis is not as big of a problem for um, of using parametric tests validly. Um, as skew would be because it has less of an impact on parameter estimates and um, standard errors and therefore um, null hypothesis significance testing. And then finally, we have our statistical tests of normality. There's three of them. I really don't like these tests, mainly because of the fact that they're almost always statistically significant, especially for data that has large sample sizes, which we do. We have 666 kids. So it's a very sensitive test. And of course, they're significant, but that's not unusual because we know that there's, there's some positive kurtosis in the, in the residuals. And moving on to the second last part of this tutorial, we're going to talk about multiple regression and then assessing interactions. So multiple regression is it uses the same form of the formula, but as we we've reviewed above, we're actually now adding a new predictor. In this case, um, uh, the amount of time a kid plays video games, and so let's run that model and get the and summarize it so we can get the um, the statistics. And again, we have our. Descriptive statistics of the residuals, we have our coefficients, their names, as well as their unstandardized coefficients, uh, the standard errors of those coefficients, the t statistics of those coefficients, and the two sided p values. We have the alpha levels of those p values, and then we have the fit statistics. So we have the standard deviation of the residuals, the unadjusted r squared, so it's slightly more variance is explained, 4% now to about you know, five or six to seven percent, and the adjusted R squared sort of tells the same story that about six percent of the overall variance in aggression scores are predicted by these two by this model. 
And then we have the F statistic comparing the full model with the intercept only model, which is which is uh, significant. Unsurprisingly, it's an you know overall good fit, but the absolute in absolute terms, it doesn't actually explain that much of the variance. And then you may already know this, but what we notice, of course, is that parenting a course of parenting style remains a positive predictor of child aggression, even after controlling for the amount of video games the kids play. And similarly, playing more video games is associated with more aggression, even after controlling for a um, course of parenting style. And then we can get the unstandardized coefficients, which some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not be. So it's no longer simply the Pearson correlation coefficient between the predictor and the outcome, but rather what's called the partial correlation. Um, it's called a partial correlation because of the fact that in a multiple um, regression framework, what each uh, parameter estimate is, is basically the um, effect of that particular predictor after controlling for or accounting for the effects of all other predictors in the model. So controlling for, so what, what, what a partial correlation coefficient is, is basically when the, is the correlation between a predictor after quote unquote partialing out the effect of all the other predictors in the model. So the partial correlation between parenting style or course of parenting style is uh, point one seven, so somewhat lower than the the zero order Pearson correlation, which was 0 0.21, and then similarly the video game the partial correlation for playing video games is 0 0.14. So basically, what that tells us is is that um, although this is likely not a significantly a significant difference, but some of the effect of a course of parenting style is explained by a um, video game playing. So that's why the co the uh, the estimates went down. And finally, to end this tutorial, we're going to be explaining how you sort out statistically significant interactions between continuous variables. So here's our multiple regression with, uh, and we're using this asterisk as a shorthand to define the lower order and higher order effects automatically. So let's run that. And you'll see that it, it gets the intercept, the lower order effects of each predictor. So that's the course of parenting style and the amount of time the kid plays television. And then it has the interaction between them, which is indicated by that colon. So let's get the summary statistics of that. So it's the exact same uh, output, except now we have this interaction term, which is statistically significant. And uh, of course, the lower order effects are also significant. They're also all positive predictors. But the interaction term, it has this negative um, coefficient, which is kind of interesting. Um, and we're going to sort that out by doing by, by um, analyzing the actual uh, interaction effect in a moment. So let's get the unstandard or the standardized coefficients. And that's what you see here. But the purpose of this part of the tutorial is actually to sort out the interaction. So how do we do that? So there's a helpful helpful um, uh, package that you've installed called Interaction. And it allows you to plot the interaction as well as do what's called a simple slopes analysis. So we're going to run both of those and I'm going to walk you through them. So to begin, let's just go over the code. Very simple. You say, for both of them, you say, I want to do, I want to apply this function to this particular model. You tell the function what the predictor is, and then you tell it what the moderator, the moderating variable is. It doesn't really matter. You could switch them around. Um, you know, you could put the parenting style as the moderator or the television as a moderator. I just, or yeah, television as a moderator. I just put them this way. Um, uh, yeah, I just put them this way. So we're saying the moderator is television, so we're saying that the effect of parenting style on child aggression scores is moderated by television. And we want to figure out what exactly that means because we do have this significant interaction. And then for the plot, we just define the x and y axis labels. And then for the simple slopes, it's the exact same. The last piece, though, is a true-false statement, which allows us to calculate what's called the johnson neyman interval, which I'm going to show you what is. And I recommend calculating it because it just gives you a lot more information about the interaction between the two continuous variables. So let's run it. Okay, what happened? So we were, let's look at the plot. So there's the plot. And this is the simple slopes analysis. I want, to, I want you to ignore that for a second. We're going to explore it. We're just going to focus on this. And then we have our plot to so we because these basically align, they tell you the same information. 
So notice our plot. We got on the y-axis a, a child aggression scores, the x-axis we have our course of parenting style. Um, and then we we are saying we basically are showing how the effective course of parenting style on child aggression store child aggression scores um, is influenced by or moderated by or is varies as a function of how much television a kid watches. So what this plot shows is that if you have low levels of television watching, so that's one standard deviation below the mean, then there's a much steeper slope uh, for the coercive parenting style and aggression scores effect. In other words, um, there's a stronger effect between um, uh, course of parenting style and aggression scores when you have low levels of television watching, which is what we see here, um, or here, sorry. So this is low levels of television watching. So it tells you what one standard deviation below the mean is of television watching is 1.6. So if you're scoring around there, um, around 1.66 in your television score, then the effect of Parenting style on aggression has um, this particular unstandardized coefficient, which is a statistically significant effect, which notice is higher than what we observed in our, um, uh, in our, uh, sorry, which is actually higher than the, the other effects. So the, compared to the mean and compared to the, uh, the uh, high levels of television watching. So uh, if we look at the mean level, which is this um, darker dashed line, um, so if you have mean average levels of television watching, you still have a statistically significant effect of a coercive parenting style on child aggression, but it's less strong. The effect is not as strong for those who just watch, av for kids who watch average levels of television. And finally, if a kid watches a lot of television, so they're one standard deviation above the mean, there's actually a non-significant effect of um, a course of parenting style on um, child aggression scores. And that's indicated by this solid blue line here. In other words, kids who watch average or lower levels of television, having a course of parenting style actually is associated with um, uh, higher levels of aggression. Whereas, whereas for those who watch, whereas for kids who watch a lot of television, they don't actually a course of parenting style doesn't actually have a significant effect on their um, levels of aggression. And the johnson Naiman interval um, basically tells you the same information, but kind of fleshes it out in more detail. It tells you when the television score is outside of this particular interval, then the slope of parenting style is statistically significant. So if anything less than 2.27, um, on this on this five point scale of television watching is associated with um, or has a statistically statistically significant uh, effect of a course of parenting style on aggression scores and any and if you have anything above two point two seven then you then there is no evidence that a course of parenting style is associated with uh, child aggression and that is how you sort out. Um, significant interactions using R. As you can see, it's a little bit complicated. You have to think a lot about significant interactions, but that's just the nature of interactions. And that is the end of this particular tutorial. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, looking forward to our next tutorial when we further explore the child aggression study data, um, uh, again, using these linear regression analyses, but doing more fancy things with the linear regression analysis. So thank you very much and um, take care. Bye.